Okay, it's September 20th, 2022, 7.34 p.m. I'm gonna call the uh, meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission to order. Members present, myself, John Tehan, Bob Shabbat, Andy Marco, Doug Roberts, Rebecca Sanoski, and Joseph Hall. No applications for receipt tonight brings us to item D, public hearing. So this is the continuation of PZ-22-10. Zone change application R80 to SDZ related to a zone change in concept plan application for section 1215.4B, Zero River Road, MLB 34-0090A through 34-0090B, 34-0090C owner, Barini Circle Associates LLC and Perlton LLC, Assad LLC and Bring LLC applicant Thomas Cody. So the applicant is up. better. Uh, Mr. Chairman, good evening. My name is Tom Cody. I'm an attorney at the firm of Robinson and Cole. Our office is located at 280 Trumbull Street in Hartford, and I'm here on behalf of the applicant and HG Acquisitions LLC. Um, we're looking forward to presenting to you some responses uh, to questions and comments that have been made throughout the three nights of the public hearing. Um, and we'd also like to provide just a general summation of the application for you and, um, and answer questions that you may have. Um, this application is a joint effort of Hillwood, which is a US-based development company with projects in 29 states across the country, as well as five other countries, and the New Haven Group, which is a development and commercial real estate services group founded by Stephen Glace. Um, so on this slide, I'm just, we're just sort of pointing out some of the uh, topics that we will cover tonight in our presentation. And those will include providing, again, an overview of the SDZ process and where we fit into that at this time the studies that will be required if this project were to move forward to special permit, uh, to the special permit phase, site location, the zone change map, summary of fiscal impact. We'd like to show you a comparison to a residential subdivision concept, as well as a comparison between residential and warehouse uses relating to water and sewer usage. Um, we will show you, to answer some questions that have been asked, locations of aquifer protection areas in the region, as well as the watersheds that are in the area of the project site. We will look at the comparable building types that are anticipated for the project. We also have uh, this evening a preliminary schematic floor plan um, to show you that would mimic the uh, building types that we've already shown you. We'd like to discuss 
geotechnical issues, including the type of rock uh, that we expect to find here at the site, as well as the means and methods for the excavation and the potential use of explosives for site clearing. Um, we have a number of points to make responding to questions on traffic, and then we'll provide a summary of the application at the end and potential next steps. So um, we are at the first step of your strategic development zone process, which is that we have to show you a master concept plan brought to a 30% level of design and present to you the proposed use. And we have done that in this application. The proposed use is a warehouse uh, facility at this building. And if you were to approve this application to rezone the property from R80 to the SDZ, then the next step would be that a special permit application with a full site plan would be required. Of course, special permit applications require a public hearing with the Planning and Zoning Commission. We also expect that we will be uh, preparing and filing an inland wetlands permit application and um, to be determined is, is the level of impact that might be proposed and whether the Wetland Commission would feel the need to have a public hearing or not. Um, we also anticipate the need for several different state level approvals, including traffic, as well as permits and approvals from the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, um, which would include the alternative treatment system and subsurface sewage disposal permit, as well as um, stormwater general permits that would be required prior to any construction at the site. Um, so this is a very long process. This is just the first step. Um, and should you approve this, we will then embark on a considerable amount of work preparing the next level of project permitting and the applications. I think one Final point on process that's very important is that your regulations specifically provide that if you approve an SDZ designation for property and the applicant does not obtain a site plan approval from you within one year, then the SDZ will expire and the zoning of the property will revert from that SDZ designation back to the original zoning, which in this case would mean reverting back to the existing R80 zoning. So by building that into your regulations, you have really protected yourself in the town um, from having approvals or rezonings potentially last indefinitely into the future. You've put that one year limit on it and that applicant must satisfy you with a site plan and special permit that you will approve. Um, so that is, a, that is a key provision, I think, that you built into the regulations when you adopted them. So now, the next step of a special permit application requires many different studies, reports, analyses, and site investigations. We've uh, discussed these with you before. The list is here. Um, but I think some of the questions that came out from public comment, including, for example, the Conservation Commission and some of their questions, really go to the studies that would be needed for the special permit phase and would be required for a special permit. For example, a full geotechnical investigation of the site, um, understanding the bedrock and the characteristics of the bedrock, the different types of rock that would be present, hydrogeological investigation, understanding the hydrogeology of the site, lighting plans, photometric plans, 
sightline study, which is really a study of the building design and its visibility from different vantage points in the area. We would look at that very, very carefully and present those analyses to you. Air quality, including air quality, potential air emissions from the facility itself, as well as vehicular traffic. Noise study. Um, this would look very specifically to the applicable regulations at the state and local level and understand what kind of sound would be generated by the facility and whether mitigation might be appropriate, such as sound walls of, of various types. The fiscal impact study, we've given you that preliminary look. We anticipate that we could do a deeper dive into that and understand, for example, um, impacts on employment uh, from the project as we move into the more detailed project level. Stormwater management report would be a big part of the application's engineering. Um, this would include all of the analysis for the best management practices for managing stormwater discharge from the site. We would, of course, do a wetlands investigation, full delineation and inventory, um, assessment of functions and values of the existing resources, and then look at the project and understand what potential impacts might result from that. If there are vernal pools on the site, that would be included in that wetland impact assessment. Um, as I mentioned, we would be presenting an application to the state of Connecticut for a subsurface sewage disposal system. That requires its own full engineering analysis. Um, wildlife assessments, um, this would include understanding whether any endangered, threatened, or special concern species are located at the site. And then finally, we anticipate doing a screening study for historic and archaeological resources. So all of that comes with the special permit and site plan application and would give a whole additional level of detail that would inform the project design. So again, very quickly, the location of the site 160 acres of, uh, of land, roughly located right next to Interstate 84. The site has direct street frontage on River Road. It is currently zoned R80. It is located right near the entrance, exit and entrance ramps um, at exit 70. The zone change map, which we showed you at the start, we have three properties included here, right here is the area, currently R80. And then here's the, uh, really just a simple designation of what that change would be to SDZ. Um, I think these maps, the zone change map serves as a reminder that if you did not have your strategic development zone process, a zone change application that we might present to you would not have much more information than what's on this map right here. The traditional zone change process is very rudimentary. And um, in Connecticut, Connecticut law really limits what a commission can consider in a traditional zone change rezone type application. And so there wouldn't be a whole lot to look at beyond the zone change map but what you have done is you have adopted regulations that give you more authority to require information at this stage. And that's a real benefit because you're getting all of the preparation and presentation that we've provided to you in the conceptual master plan to help guide you through this decision on the zone change. Um, we touched on the plan of conservation and development. This is a page out of the um, business and economic development page. Zooming in here, you can see that a portion of this site right here is located within an area that was designated in the POCD as a possible area for evaluating business zoning potential. 
the SDZ zone is an appropriate zone for that because it is primarily a business zone. Uh, a range of uses are permitted in the SDZ, including commercial, retail, and warehouse uses. The POCD also stresses that the town should strive to be ready, willing, and able to help companies looking to bring economic development to Willington, and that we would submit is exactly what this application starts the process to do. The POCD also identifies target industries for economic expansion that include distribution and logistics, which would be consistent with the proposed warehouse use um, for the project. Okay, so we handed out at the beginning of our presentation the first night, we gave you a summary of the anticipated municipal fiscal impact. And um, it is a relevant factor. It's mentioned in the POCD. So we undertook retaining a highly respected Connecticut consultant, Goman and York, to study what the fiscal and economic impacts of the project might be to the town. And as I said, we shared with you that one page summary of it. Goman and York studied a project size that would be between 1.3 and 1.5 million square feet of warehouse space and the anticipated gross annual tax revenues are estimated to be between 3.3 and 3.8 million dollars per year. Goman and York also looked at what the potential uh, municipal government service costs might be associated with the project. They used what they believe to be as a conservative figure of 33% of the total tax revenues, still leaving the town with a net annual tax revenue gain of 2.4 to $2.7 million. In addition, there would be significant one-time development fees, new jobs, and the wealth creation that would come with these new jobs. And so when you consider what the town's current budget for total tax revenue is, between 14 and $15 million, adding over $2 million of new revenue would be a huge asset to the town. And this new tax revenue could be used to finance any number of new needed public improvements. And best of all, this all occurs through a project which is before you that would be located on property right next to the interstate highway. It maximizes economic benefit and it minimizes impacts to the town. Um, two final points I'd like to make on this before we move on. A number of people have asked us questions about whether there might be a potential tax abatement in the future. So first, let me state for the record, neither Hillwood nor the New Haven Group has any intention of seeking a tax abatement from the town of Willington. So that from the standpoint of the developer, they do not expect to seek a tax abatement from the town. Secondly, we just point out that if any other entity, for example, a potential tenant of the facility were to decide to seek a tax abatement, that decision is entirely up to the town to decide whether to grant or not. So only the town can decide whether to grant a tax abatement. So even if another entity other than this developer asked for it, it is in the town, the ball is in the town's court to decide whether to grant that or not. If the town decided not to grant it, then you're looking at realizing the full impact of the, of the tax revenue from the development. Okay, so as you consider this zone change, we think it's relevant to think about the existing zoning of the property because indeed, if this project does not go forward, 
The property owner may very well take that as a signal um, that they should simply move forward with um, a potential development concept that would involve the existing zoning of the property, which is R80. So considering what a residential concept might be, um, this is 160 acres, uh, R80 zone, roughly a two acre minimum lot size uh, zone. You could probably get 50 to 60 um, single family lots on the property. Um, the concept plan before you right here is just a very simple concept that lays out 60 two acre uh, residential lots. Um, it includes 23% open space, which would exceed the requirement for a residential subdivision. Um, and I think it's clear that even a residential subdivision involves extensive tree clearing, grading, and site disruption. It would involve construction of quite an extensive length of public streets, which would have to be plowed, paved, and maintained by the town. And of course, a residential subdivision would certainly generate a considerable number of school-aged children that would need to be educated. Each of these lots would also be required to have an individual well for its potable water and an individual septic system. So you would have 60 wells and 60 septic systems. Now in a minute, Jeff Fitzgerald from Bowler Engineering will sort of show you what those numbers equate to. Because a warehouse project that we anticipate is a relatively low water user. And it probably ends up with a water consumption number which is comparable to that subdivision that you're looking at right there on the slide. The clear disadvantage to this concept of a residential plan is that rather than having water and sewer collectively under state permits to be managed and maintained collectively, you end up having 60 individual homeowners responsible for pumping their tanks and maintaining those facilities. Um, so it misses an opportunity to have a more comprehensively maintained approach to water and sewer. Um, as we've indicated, the permit that we would be required to obtain from the state of Connecticut will require an extensive site investigation and study and analysis of the entire site um, in order to get that permit. And I think that's a good comparison because the residential subdivision, as you know from having reviewed subdivision applications, the level of information you get is less detailed than you will get in a special permit that will drill down into all of the detail that accompanies the project. So you not only have an extensive amount of site disruption from this, but you may find yourself with less control and less ability to manage the development than you would through the special permit process. Um, so what I'd like to do at this point is have Jeff Fitzgerald from, from Bowler come up and walk you through a little bit more detail about the water and sewer um, utilities that would be provided to our project and to compare them to what might be created by an as of right residential subdivision plan. And then Jeff is gonna continue to cover a few other topics and uh, responses to questions. Thank you, Tom. I'm Jeff Fitzgerald, professional engineer, certified planner with Bowler. We're located at 65 LaSalle Road in West Hartford, Connecticut. And to put a finer point on what Tom was saying about 
uh, the difference in 60 two acre residential lots so because they're individual lots you can have individual lots can get permitted with the local health district for flows up to 7500 gallons a day where where we our application said that uh, our use anticipates uh, not more than 30,000 gallons a day water usage in septic septic flows so um, to permit a septic system for a, a typical house on a two acre lot, it would probably be a, a four bedroom house. You're required to design for 150 gallons per day per bedroom for the first three bedrooms and then 75 gallons a day for the fourth bedroom, which equates to 525 gallons per day per house. Multiply that times 60 houses on that lot and you're looking at over 31,000 gallons uh, per day. And so because it's one lot, uh, because that's, like I said, 60 lots, they, that can be permitted locally. You can have just a, a, a homeowner manages that septic system, homeowner puts in the wells, and it's, you have 60 individual uh, septic systems uh, with no oversight. When you do it in one 30,000 gallon per day operation, like we were proposing as part of our SDZ application, like Tom said, you are required to do a DEP underground injection control permit. That has requirements for advanced treatment to reach uh, specific effluent uh, numbers. You have to remove nitrogen, specific uh, different pollutants that impact waters in a different way that septic systems don't. This is the kind of systems you're required to do in sensitive watersheds, coastal watersheds um, often have to do this. So we would be required to do that. And part of the UIC underground injection control permit process, again, it's DEP administers that. You're required to do an advanced uh, wastewater treatment system with it that meets this. And then you have a series of uh, monitoring for different uh, criteria at ar around the site uh, that's part of that permit. So it's a very, uh, very much a very regulated process, but one that's not uh, unique or very special in Connecticut. There's a, a lot of these go on and our uh, consultants that we will hire to do this are very familiar with this kind of work. And in fact, they've just done one for 50,000 gallons a day in your neighboring town to the north in Stafford. There's many uh, of that size, different schools, hospitals throughout Connecticut where we use advanced wastewater treatment systems with, uh, for, for systems with large, large flows that exceed that 7,500 gallon per day threshold. And like I said, monitored closely by DEP and you never hear any issues about them because they're very good systems, they, these, these package plants that they use. Um, Next, I want to talk a bit about the watershed questions um, that were raised. Um, and there was, seemed to be a, a bit of confusion. Um, the site is primarily in the Willimantic River watershed. And this, this is a map here. Let's see if I can, uh, if I can locate there. This is a map of the watershed of the Willimantic River. Just to orient you, this is, this is the boundary of the town of Wellington. Um, you've got Mansfield to the south, uh, Ashford to the east, Stafford to the north. In this purple is the Willimantic River watershed. Our site is right here in this area. The Willimantic River runs through here. And there was, um, again, it's a, it's a very large watershed. It's adjacent to the Fenton River watershed to the east. Uh, and it's it's fed by the Roaring Brook watershed to the Northeast, which actually feeds into the Willimantic River watershed. So you, you're dealing with a very large watershed that goes underneath the aquifer uh, protection zone. I'm the zoom aquifer protection area, which is was discussed at the last meeting, which is right here. Um, there's also uh, an aquifer protection area further south in Mansfield in the, in the uh, Willimantic River watershed, and then you see a larger 
Act for Protection area in orange in this area here, which is um, the Fenton Rivers wells. And, and those are very sensitive watershed uh, or, or aquifer protection areas, but that, that serves Yukon. Um, these are all very valuable um, aquifer protection areas. And I'll go to the next slide. Um, this shows our site along 84. And you see in this, again, within this watershed, the aquifer protection zone is over here. Um, you see there's the Condot Garage, there's um, the Wilmantic Rivers, this blue line. There's con construction quarry over here, uh, the Becker's quarry. Um, this shows uh, our site and how it drains into this area. So there's, there's, it's a, it's a, the point is it's a very large watershed and we're a very small part of it. And at the same time, when you get into the, the fine points as we're starting to study the site, it breaks into three areas. The very Northeast corner drains towards the uh, Roaring Brook watershed, which like I said, drains into the Willimantic watershed at this point, right where the River Road Athletic Complex is. Uh, and it was inaccurately said at last time's meeting that there was a aquifer protection area under that field. There's not. You can see this is where the River Road Athletic Complex is. Um, this is the aquifer protection area and River Park is down there and there are some ball fields down in that area. But uh, so like I said, the Northeast part goes to uh, this watershed, which gets in the Western side is the majority of our site, which flows directly towards Interstate 84, underneath 84 um, and to the Willimantic River watershed. But first it would have to go through the wetland system that's there and then the the southeast little corner, very much the area that has less development proposed on it in our schematic plan, drains to this subwatershed on the east side that goes through the Parazek Pond and Halls Pond, and then ultimately into the Willimantic River. So there's a lot that takes place along the way. We, the the point is, is we recognize this is a very sensitive watershed, and we've got a lot of experience working throughout the state in very sensitive watersheds. And we know how to manage stormwater and environmental conditions on a site, whether it's septic, uh, management of waste, all these things, and how to keep, protect the habitats, all the things associated with, uh, with the surrounding areas and especially aquifer protection zones. And we have uh, no concerns in our ability to manage that. Um, yes, great point, Tom. Um, one of the one of the things we do want to point out, and it's in this in this figure right here, is that from our site to the aquifer protection zone uh, located here is over two miles, and that's that's. But we're trying to get in in that way. It's a, we're we're quite a ways away from there, and there's uh, again a lot that takes place within that watershed. The watershed is much bigger than that two miles. Um, so uh, we're going to go through some of the comparable building types uh, that we plan uh, that would be representative of what would likely be built here. And then I'm going to have uh, Nate Kirshner from Hillwood talk a bit about the proposed floor plan. But in, in this, uh, this slide here, you can see the big picture. This shows how a industrial building can be made to uh, look, or a warehouse building can be made to look appropriate in a spot. You, you see examples of how we have um, grass swales leading to, to a, a stormwater management area to prevent erosion and sediment pro problems. You see the uh, an office on the corner. You see, um, you know, just the way the facade is broken up uh, with some uh, horizontal elements to to break down the massing of the building. And there's a million ways to do it. You see uh, another example in the upper right hand corner, different look. But that's the type of building that uh, Hillwood 
typically builds and we would anticipate to build here. The floor plan, uh, as you see here, has an office, uh, very small black. The reason there's very, very little to the, to the floor plan is that it's really mostly storage space. This is a, this is a building that's designed to have uh, trucks deliver uh, bulk product to this building where they're reloaded on other trucks and trailer trucks to go back out and deliver to, to stores. So you might have a trailer truck delivered all paper towels and another one delivering all uh, you know, cleansers. And that gets distributed, stored within this large area and then distributed back out on trucks. So the majority of the floor plan is storage. You, the scale of a typical office in this building is very small. That's why it's not a large water user. Um, it's, it's not a large septic user. It's mostly act, store, storage for distribution in and out. And it's not for over the road uh, local distributors uh, you know, like an Amazon. It's for uh, trailer trucks in and trailer trucks out. And that's what the schematic that we provide uh, is for. Um, we also wanted to talk a bit about the geotechnical conditions that were discussed at the last meeting. Um, um, there's a lot of discussion about Brimfield Schist, the uh, Bedrock geology map of the state of Connecticut identifies that there's potential for brimfield schist uh, under the site. The extent, the exact extent of that, whether it's there, how deep, how much, we don't know yet. It, that will be first step in uh, when you have a, an SDZ approval and we go forward for the special permit step, we'll need to understand uh, the subsurface conditions uh, on the site thoroughly. And that'll be by doing a boring program uh, that identifies all the subsurface rock, what kind of rock we have, if there's Brimfield just there, if there is, how deep is it, what's the extent of it? How do we manage that? Um, that will be step one. Our geotechnical uh, and environmental engineering consultants on our team are very familiar with this type of rock and other troublesome uh, geology. It's not uncommon to deal with uh, geologic conditions that require special foundations, special stormwater uh, considerations. Uh, and in this case, if there is uh, this kind of schist, Brimfield schist that has percent potential for issues with runoff, how to handle that. There are pre preventative and corrective design techniques that they can apply in these cases to prevent issues with runoff from the site. And if that's encountered, they will apply that. It's been done elsewhere in the country with different, different uh, types of materials, including just like this, and it can be handled. Um, and it's been done for years. Uh, and the Whitestone Engineering, uh, the, the, uh, our geotechnical consultants are well versed in this. And uh, one thing we do want to point out is that uh, people were talking about the issue of crumbling foundations in this area, and that came up at previous meetings. And that's really not a pick, and that's not applicable at all to our project because. Any concrete we use on our site will not have uh, schist and pyrotite as part of the aggregate. So it's really uh, not a relevant argument. Um, and there was a lot of uh, talk about blasting um, at, uh, and concern about, you know, will blasting be uh, disrupt people's uh, houses and everything. And the, the way every project that I've been involved in in my 30 year career that's had blasting, you use a reputable blasting company. We uh, have a main drilling blasting board on the team. This is a high uh, 
high quality company. They uh, apply the best practices um, to figure out what they can do throughout the site to make sure that uh, any potential, uh, any issues that could come from blasting uh, do not happen. We don't want anyone to have any issues with any blasting on the site. So typically a 250 foot pre-blast uh, survey radius is what is accepted as a standard practice. Um, and that's typically from the blast holes. Um, main drilling and blasting uses that typically. Um, in this instance, uh, our team would extend the pre-blast survey radius to 750 feet and measure that from the property line that we have such a large property to do a survey within our property uh, is, is sort of uh, not appropriate. So we'll, we'll extend that to the property lines um, and they'll do seismic monitoring, which uh, at at least three locations, uh, including there's, they can mount them on the uh, poles on the Eversource easement that runs through the site. Uh, there's uh, residences uh, fairly proximate to the site off of River Road that uh, we would look to do that in and we'll add seismic monitors at the discretion of the fire marshal or the building official as requested. And our team would be happy to post bonds for any impacts, uh, coordinating with the town staff on what that amount should be. Because like I said, we do not want anyone to have any issues with any construction practices, especially blasting that takes place on this site. And that's part of uh, our overall philosophy on it. And uh, at that point, I think we're gonna talk a bit about traffic. <clears throat> Thanks, Jeff. Um, for the record, my name is Kevin Soley. I'm a licensed professional engineer in the state of Connecticut um, with Soley Engineering. Uh, Office is located at 501 Main Street in Monroe. I am also I also hold the designation as a professional traffic operations engineer, um, which just is a, another certification which designates that um, I have a, a, a dedicated enough of my career to, to to be intimately involved in the workings of traffic operations and, and how to prepare traffic impact studies and, and work through those processes. Um, so I wanted to, to, to talk tonight, you know, um, you previously heard from Colleen Byrne, who's one of my associates at my company. Um, and then we obviously heard a lot of the uh, public feedback and comment at the last hearing. And, I, and uh, there was a lot of really good discussion. What I wanted to do first was just try to bring back um, some clarity on what the process is in preparing a traffic study for a project. And then the several steps a project of this size would actually have to take to go through that review and approval process. So the first thing we do is we prepare a traffic impact study, which is a detailed analysis of all of the existing area roadway network, how the network operates, um, what those existing operating conditions are. And then we look at what our proposed development might be. And we use um, uh, trip generation rates prepared by the Institute of Transportation Engineers. I know there was a lot of comments and questions and concerns about those rates. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. Um, but we look at what the trip generation is, we apply those trips to the network, and then we have to determine um, if there's any uh, potential impact from those trips. We have to design mitigation to, um, uh, uh, to, to mitigate those impacts. Um, a project of this size and scale actually has several uh, bites at the apple from a review standpoint. Um, obviously, through a local uh, site plan or special permit process, the most instances, towns and communities such as Wellington would engage a third party peer reviewer who would be paid for by the applicant's expense. That's another professional who focuses on traffic engineering to review our study, make sure it's being done in accordance with standard engineering methodologies. Um, and they get to pay uh, very close attention to what we're proposing and, and offer comments to, to make sure that our study is robust and comprehensive. Um, so that goes through that local process. In addition to that, there's an another, there's a belt and suspenders approach from a review standpoint that this commission and hopefully the community should feel uh, comfortable with that a project of this size would meet the definition um, from the Department of Transportation as a major traffic generator and would re require review and approval from the Office of State Traffic Administration. Now, what the DOT looks at is they assign that to any project that has that is over 100,000 square feet 
or has more than 200 parking spaces. So it costs, a, it, it casts a very broad net so that they have a chance to look at any potential project and really evaluate what its potential impacts may be. Um, as part of that review process, it's a, it's a multi-step process. First, we have to submit what our, uh, uh, we have to do data collection, understand what traffic volumes we should be using to do our analysis. I know there, were, there was commentary made about um, traffic volumes through the corridor um, from 2017, 2019, 2020. Obviously, there are gonna be variations just based on COVID and things like that. But the DOT makes sure that we're looking at something that's um, indicative of what a, you know, a normal uh, operation would be, not something that takes credit for a, a, a lower volume because of COVID or things like that. So first they have to review what our proposed, um, you know, what volumes we're gonna be using from an analysis. They have to review our proposed trip generation. They review our site plan, our proposed um, operations, and then they determine which trip generation rate is appropriate for the project. Um, and, I, and I'll talk about it in a minute, but from a trip generation standpoint, the project as proposed is for a warehouse. And that warehouse is, fits into a land use code um, for trip generation rates as, a, as, as established by the Institute of Transportation Engineers. And that's a, that's a national um, publication that creates rates based on both national, but also localized and regional projects of similar project types. And they have a number of different rates that can be uh, utilized for a project. A number of them have been discussed in throughout this public hearing from comments from the commissioners um, and excuse me, comments from the public. Um, and an application is very specific based on what the intended user is. And if a project as we're proposing is more for a traditional warehouse versus a high cube fulfillment center or things like that, they're gonna have different trip generations associated with it. The DOT pays very close attention to what we're proposing. It looks at, looks at the, the proposed operations. And um, if, if there's any opportunity for a, a higher rate to be applied, they'll require us to do that. Um, so uh, throughout their review, they look at our volumes, they look at our mitigation, and then they consult with a local legal traffic authority. Um, and then they establish what our, or through us and our recommendations, they establish what's required to be done to mitigate any impact. Now. Any and all of that review, any and all of those improvements, those are all costs borne by the applicant. There is no, um, uh, you know, there were comments made that if this project were to come in, it would cause a, 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 an impact to a ramp or an intersection or would require a flyover. If our analysis indicates that we need something of that magnitude to mitigate our impact, we're going to be on the hook for it. The DOT isn't paying for it. The town of Willington isn't going to have to pay for it. The applicant has to pay for it. And frankly, from a traffic standpoint, through this DOT review process and the Office of Straight Traffic Administration, not only do they, they mandate a very highly technical review that um, establishes and requires that the applicant do all of those improvements at their cost prior to a facility being able to open, um, it also reserves the right that if for any reason, the traffic experience at a project is more than what was anticipated, they have the right to come back in require and require the applicant and the project proponent to do additional improvements. And if for whatever reason, we did a study, we said, all right, we need to do some widening here and add a lane there and we do those improvements and then the project opens and the traffic generation is more than anticipated, the DOT can come back in and say, this isn't enough. You need to widen over here. You need to add a signal here. And I've actually been a part of projects and I've seen projects where, you know, initially they, uh, um, they didn't have a, a traffic signal and the DOT came back and said, your gym generates more traffic than anticipated. You have to put a signal in and it was the responsible of the developer to pay for those costs. So there's through this Office of State Traffic Administration process and this, this MTG certificate process, um, they have additional provisions and, and protections in place to ensure that any project will not have an adverse impact on the area uh, traffic, you know, surrounding area traffic roadway network and that there's always a, a way to make sure that um, any impacts are, and costs associated with, with mitigating those impacts are borne by the developer. Um, additionally, in, in addition to the technical review from a traffic standpoint, obviously Route 32 and River Road is a state road. So there's also an additional encroachment permit review process that gets dealt with through the DOT district office. Again, they have to make sure that any, of all, any and all improvements or work in the right of way is being done in accordance with their requirements. Signage has to be installed in accordance with their requirements, in accordance with the manual uniform traffic control devices, the MUTCD, which I know was referenced a couple of times 
throughout the uh, throughout the, the the comments. And and again, all of these improvements are borne entirely by the developer, and there's no cost or exposure or risk that any um, financial impact would happen to the town of Wellington. In fact, it's all required to be done by the developer. Um, and again, I kind of wanted to just touch on again from a trip generation standpoint, as I mentioned, um, you know, the ITE establishes trip generation rates based on specific land use codes. And I know that there was some commentary that, well, this project is more like a fulfillment center and not a warehouse. Um, I kind of wanted to touch on some of the differences um, between the two, you know, a traditional warehouse, which is what's being proposed here. You know, it's less automated, more manual movement of product, uh, slower inventory turnaround, you know, product could be there for a month or several months or, or, or longer, generally stores bulk quantities of smaller variety of products, uh, function is solely to store product for future use, and typically requires less passenger car parking per square foot as a result of fewer employees performing the same task. Um, uh, you know, there was comments made about potentially a high cube fulfillment center, which, which would generate more trips than a traditional warehouse. Um, but those are, you know, this, what's being proposed here isn't that. Um, those are usually highly automated, um, sometimes utilizing robotics for efficiency. There's faster inventory turnaround time, um, generally stores lesser quantities of a larger variety of product. Um, it functions to receive orders, pack orders, label ship orders, and manage returns. And it typically, typically requires more passenger car parking per square foot due to a higher number of employees needed to complete a lot of those fulfillment tasks. Um, so, and again, what's currently proposed is, is the warehouse trip generation or land use code, not the high cube fulfillment center. But that, with that being said, um, this process will result in again as, as we as i mentioned several bites in the apple if if our if if this zone change was approved we move forward a special permit process and we brought an application before this commission our study would be based on the anticipated user of that facility and how the, that user would be intended to operate and at this point we believe it's a warehouse a traditional uh, land use code 150 warehouse Let's say the project, we, we do our analysis, we say we can do some roadway widening here, we can address any and all concerns, um, and then the project moves forward and it's approved. If during, if at some point a tenant is identified and they would like to do a different type of operation than what was approved, we have to come back to this commission. It would require a, a modification of the special permit, it would require a modification to the traffic study, it would require a more in-depth analysis to understand if any additional trips were generated by that project, how they would be put on the network, how, how it may impact traffic operations. And again, the, the, the applicant would have to do whatever is required to mitigate those impacts. So, and again, all that mitigation has to be conducted at their cost and expense. So there are several opportunities for this type of analysis to be reviewed, to be peer reviewed, to be reviewed by the DOT, who obviously um, you know, regulates and, and, and manages the infrastructure on Route 32 and beyond. Um, so I think that I wanted to you know, make it a point that there's, there, there's several opportunities for this to be reviewed and, 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 and the DOT is not shy to require improvements uh, if, if a project is proposed to have any kind of adverse impact. Um, you know, the, um, just to go back, you know, we did obviously look, there's more than adequate right of way along River Road and Route 32 to provide for, you know, specialized left turn treatment into the site. I can assure you that, you know, there's, there's more room to, uh, to accommodate any and all traffic associated with this development and not impact vehicles going north and south up River Road. Um, you know, I know there were a lot of comments and, and concerns raised about intersection site distance, um, both at some of the existing ramps um, and, uh, you know, what would be provided at this at our proposed driveway. Um, you know, we have a situation where there's existing geometry that's out there. Um, that being said, as part of a DOT review, they will require us to look at any and all um, available site distances. Um, for anywhere where we may be applying traffic, they'll require us to ensure that there's adequate site distance to, you know, satisfy their requirements and, and look at, you know, stopping site distance, things like that, to make sure that there aren't any geometric issues, which could potentially affect or impact, um, you know, traffic operating conditions out there. So because the project is the size and scale that it is, it has this additional review process tied to it. and. You know, I, 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 we've been doing this a long time and, and, and thankfully I think the Department of Transportation does do a very good job of reviewing these applications and making sure that these applications provide sufficient mitigation 
to address any potential impacts. Um, so, you know, with that, I, I, again, I just wanted to, to, to reiterate, um, you know, there was concerns about trip generation. The trip generation that we're proposing is appropriate. We've actually consulted with the Department of Transportation. They've actually, you know, reviewed the plan and, and said, yes, that's appropriate. But again, if the operations were to change, we'd have to update a study, do additional analysis. Um, and, and again, there's, there is my professional opinion that, you know, once we do a full complete study, there's gonna be more than adequate um, uh, infrastructure to support the project. And uh, the applicant would require to perform any mitigation necessary to ensure that there's no adverse impact to the area roadway network. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to pass it on to Mr. Kirshner. And I'm, and I'm here and happy to answer any other questions the commission may have uh, regarding traffic operations. Thanks, Kevin. Oh, good evening. Go backwards a few slides. Um, for, for the record, my name is for the record, my name is Nate Kirshner. I'm a development director with Hillwood. Um, I have not spoke spoke to this commission yet. Uh, I did speak to at the community meeting. Um, wanted to get up and just highlight a few points that were brought up by the technical team, uh, as well as introduce myself as the applicant. Uh, our office, there's been a lot of talk. Hillwood is a, a Dallas-based company. However, uh, I'm a Connecticut resident. I was born and raised in Connecticut. Our office is in Middletown, Connecticut. And I feel like that's an important piece to bring up because I'm down the road. Uh, if issues come up along the special permit process or should we proceed, should we proceed to the special permit process or into construction, uh, I'm a 35 minute drive away. Um, so I just wanted to make that point. Uh, another point is going back to the building architecture. These are buildings that Hillwood has built. And I wanna emphasize that they, they are warehouses. There's been talk about truck stops. There's been talk about other types of uses and things. Uh, these store, whether it's furniture or TVs, um, they store products that sit in a warehouse. There's really no other way to describe it. Uh, Kevin spoke, uh, Tom spoke about the use. And again, if the use changes, uh, we would be back in front of this commission. Um, the very basic floor plan is really just here to demonstrate the fact that you get a lot of open space for storage. Um, there's a couple offices, there's restrooms, there's emergency egresses, but essentially this is what this building will look like. The important thing I wanna note is we won't build this building without a tenant. And that's always a, a apologize. That, that's always something worth reminding everybody, this is a big building. The biggest building built without a tenant in the state of Connecticut, to my knowledge, was about 400,000 square feet. We would proceed through the special permit process, likely without a tenant, um, given the opportunity. However, as part of the building application, we would have a tenant in mind. We would be able to identify that tenant. And if that tenant were a use, um, zoning is reviewed as part of the building permit process to ensure that it complies with what was approved. So. It's very similar to saying we're coming into building a pharmacy and just not identifying it as a CVS or a Walgreens. And I just want to make that that point clear. Um, there's a lot of belts and suspenders in place for the commission as this project moves forward to ensure that what we ultimately are going to build is the use that we are telling you it's going to be. Um, the only other item I wanted to talk about, um, we're extremely sensitive to the public concern for blasting. Um, we talked to Maine Drilling and Blasting. Uh, they're a Connecticut company. Uh, actually, in speaking with them, and we've done projects in the past with them, uh, they actually did the blasting for the Loves. I didn't realize that the Loves truck stop had blasting. And I don't know if members of the public knew that there was a lot of blasting associated with the Loves, but I thought that was an interesting data point. Um, there is no state explosive code requirement for monitoring. The general rule of thumb is 250 feet. Um, to echo what Jeff said, we looked at that. We talked to Maine Blasting about this site and our project specifically. Um, the 250 foot rule is general practice. Uh, the requirement is to install one seismic monitor on the closest structure. The closest structure for this structure for this project is the Eversource utility poles on site. Um, so our general practice and rule, really the rule of thumb is seismic monitors on the on-site utility poles and monitor in pre-blast surveys 250 feet from the bore, the, the, the explosive bore locations to help. And obviously this is a 
a zone change application. So approvals could not be conditioned. I mean, we couldn't approve, condition the approvals, but things that could be considered in a special permit approval could be conditioned on are, we're open to extending that blast radius from the industry standard of 250 feet to 750 feet. We, we could discuss it going further if need be. Um, that distance is typically measured from where you're drilling a hole and where you're putting the explosive. Given the size of the site, we're willing to extend that blast, that uh, pre-blast survey to 750 feet from the property line, not from the bore location. Um, and then again, while one seismic monitor would be required uh, in talking with main drilling and blasting, the thought was, we know we have to do one on the Eversource poles on site. We would offer to do an additional one. A logical location would be the residence adjacent to the property on our side of River Road. And then we would work with the fire marshal and building officials or commission members or whoever to determine a location for a, a third uh, monitoring. Uh, and then again, um, those survey results, we'd work with the town staff and whoever is necessary to figure out what an appropriate bonding amount would be. Just to ensure that if any, any in, in impacts did occur, um, there's no, no issue getting the money to repair those damages. Um, with that, um, I will hand it back to Attorney Cody to summarize. Um, again, for the record, Tom Cody, just a few final thoughts in summation of the application. Um, this project, if allowed to proceed um, to the permitting phase, would propose for you an economic anchor for employment and growth and would, if constructed, become one of the, immediately become one of the very largest taxpayers in town. The rezoning that's been proposed is consistent with the POCD. POCD clearly identifies much of the project site as an area that has the potential for business related rezonings. The conceptual master plan that we've shown you describes using state of the art engineering practices, including stormwater best management practices, consistent with an array of state and federal regulations in addition to local uh, zoning requirements. Kevin Solly just gave you a very thorough review of the traffic assessment process. Um, the preliminary assessment that the uh, Solly Engineering has prepared does not anticipate negative impacts to the local roadway network. And part of that is due to the site's excellent location adjacent to I-84. We believe that the application is complete. I'd like to address for a minute the, some of the comments that Mr. Ralph Toulis made. Um, he did speak to you and also prepared a letter that was submitted and he identified four issues that he thinks indicate that the application is not complete. We respectfully disagree um, with Mr. Toulis on that point. And I'd like to just quickly review um, what, what we think is the, is, the, is the correct interpretation of the completeness issue. So the first point Mr. Toulis said was he thinks that the application is not complete because the schematic floor plan was not submitted. Well, to be clear, the regulations do not require a schematic floor plan. What the regulations say is that building elevations, schematic floor plans, or, or photographs of comparable buildings must be shown. In our initial presentation to you, we showed you photographs of comparable building types. That satisfies the application requirement. But we have, as you know tonight, also shown you a schematic floor plan. Um, and that schematic floor plan is fairly simple because as uh, Nate Kirshner described to you, the vast majority of the building is used for storage. It is a storage warehouse. So there isn't a lot of detail there because of the simplicity of it, but nevertheless, we've prepared it and submitted it. And we have a copy for you tonight um, for your file. Um, 
Secondly, the suggestion was made that we had not shown all of the known environmental features on the plans. Um, and Mr. Toulis listed a number of things that he suggested were not included on the plans. We did include the mapped wetlands. The town wetlands mapping is reflected on the base map of our concept plan. We did include that. There are no flood zones on the property, so none are shown. There are no aquifer protection areas located on the site. As Jeff Fitzgerald told you a short while ago, the closest aquifer protection area is two miles away. So there are no aquifer protection areas to show and there are no flood zones. Um, we showed you what the town mapping has for wetlands. So we think that the application is complete in regards to the known environmental features. Thirdly, Mr. Toulis asked, where is the pre-application conference staff report? Mr. D'Amato uh, told you at the beginning of this that in his packet that he submitted with his materials, a report of the pre-application conference was included in that. Um, our professional team did meet with Mr. D'Amato and Mr. Roberts. It was in April and his notes from that are in your record. And then finally, Mr. Toulis said, you know, a statement of how the project or the development would comply with the POCD is required. And then in the next sentence, he admitted that we did produce that. We did provide that. And indeed, we've had extensive discussions with you about that over the course of the proceeding about how we believe it is consistent with the POCD. So we think we more than satisfied that part of the application. So in conclusion on, on the question of application completeness, um, we're very certain that the application is complete and it, it does include all of the information and um, documentation that you require. Um, so we certainly uh, hope that the application is approved. We heard a number of people Many members of the public expressed great interest in hearing more detail about the project. And I mentioned earlier, the Conservation Commission's letter was asking for more detail. These details will, of course, be produced at the time that they're required, which is first in the wetlands permit application, uh, second special permit with a full site plan package attached to that. The process for project permitting will be rigorous. You've heard a number of different speakers uh, on our team talk to you about the different disciplines that they're involved in and the rigor that will be associated with the review of each part of this application process. And if at the end of the special permit process, you don't believe that a special permit should be approved, then you can deny the special permit and the time will quickly expire and the zoning of SDZ will revert back to R80. And at that point, it's just back to the current situation and the property owner can decide at that point what they want to do uh, without working with this applicant. We greatly appreciate the input that we have received from the public. And we mean that sincerely. We have heard many comments and questions. And in our view, all of that helps to inform us about issues that we will be sensitive to as we work through the project design and the application preparation process. And I think that the, the comments that we've received, the information we've gotten, will help to make it a better project. Um, and because of the extensive permitting that we've described, public input is going to continue. <clears throat> there will be multiple public hearings, opportunities for members of the public to ask questions, provide input, express opinions about the applications that will be coming down the line. So that public input will continue and that process will continue. And we're committed 
to trying to be as receptive to that as, as much as we can. Um, you also know that several key state departments will be involved in the review of aspects of this, including uh, a very deep dive on traffic impacts, geotechnical issues associated with subsurface sewage disposal and endangered species and associated issues. We believe that this is a great opportunity for Willington. We hope that you agree and will give this professional team the opportunity to undertake the next steps in project permitting. Um, with that, um, we'll stop, conclude our presentation. Thank you very much for your attention and patience. Um, we're certainly happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay, thank you. At, at this point, we're gonna open up uh, for questions from the commission. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask a question related to jobs while uh, my colleagues are formulating some. Let's see, I've been doing quite a bit of traveling lately for work and I have been finding myself down in Pennsylvania, uh, you know, uh, down in Schuylkill Haven area where uh, Pottsville, Pine Grove, those little towns, some distribution centers around there, Wegmans, you know, in uh, Pottsville. So I had the opportunity to stay at the Hampton Inn in uh, Pine Grove. It's got 80 rooms. 67 of those rooms for the last three years have been rented to people that are working in the distribution center because they can't find them in the area. Most of them from the Philadelphia area, they bring them over to work there. So, you know, from my layman's eyes, when I'm down in that area, it's a relatively depressed area. You'd think, you know, they'd, they'd fill the jobs locally, but that doesn't appear to be the case. So what, what's gonna be the difference, you know, you think here with even, you know, with the large number of jobs do you see these issues in other sites that you built where they they can't find the the talent locally to staff these uh, these these large uh, distribution centers? Good job, Nate Kirshner with Hill again. Um, so the job question is a great question. Um, and that's something particularly in New England, as we look at warehouse uses and, and jobs, um, we're extremely sensitive to the, the tenants we talk to like this area. Uh, local being, I guess, a geographical term, Manchester, Willimannock, local higher density areas are really the, the source of the job location. The proximity to the highway is what speaks volumes to this to this site location being preferable but there's speak up. i'm sure you speak up a little like i can't make out a lot of what you're saying part of, part of it's my height thank I'll you i'll move the microphone sorry um you know, i'm going to start over i apologize sure um again local is really a kind of a, a, a subjective term we look at that as kind of really it's highway access and jobs and, and availability to workforce um this site works very well from a job perspective from the conversations we've had with prospective tenants, with the conversations we've had with um, companies that do actually job uh, availability analysis. Uh, Manchester, Willimannock are obviously higher density populations with a workforce that would support a building such as this. Um, I, I can't speak to Pennsylvania. I do know there's, I've read recently an article that people are actually being bussed in from Southern New Jersey to some of the Pennsylvania sites, not because there's a shortage of worker, but because that's the best place to find a decent paying job. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to contradict anything you've heard because I don't know the specifics of that area, uh, but there was an article that I recently read and I found it interesting that people are actually electing to take the higher paying warehouse jobs in, a, you know, in the Lehigh Valley, um, be, you know, be away from their family for four or five days a week and then go home on the weekends. Um, so I don't know, like I said, if that's specifically, if that's germane to where you where you were, um, but hopefully that answers your question. Like I said, we're we're, we're confident that there's enough workforce, um, and that these jobs are well paying enough to get people to to support the jobs. 
Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'm just going to take a minute here to hand out two, two items. One, I have copies of the PowerPoint presentation that we just showed you. And then Kevin is handing out a copy of that one page schematic floor plan that we showed you tonight. Okay, thank you. Um, I did have a question. I noticed in your drawings as you're designating the SDZ zone that the mobile property that currently is a gas station that you're looking to, are you looking to rezone that, purchase that? Um, so that was not, as I understood it, part of this. I'm just wondering if that was just a, oops, we forgot to go around it, or is that to be purchased along with this? The, um couple of pieces to that answer. First off, the mobile site is included in the boundary of the area that would be rezoned to SDZ. NHG acquisitions, Hillwood, New Haven Group have no in interest or intent or contract to purchase that parcel with the mobile site. It's currently owned by another entity this group will not be buying it. And we also have no intention of including it in any special permit or site plan application that we would file. Um. Uh, you've um, made uh, uh, quite a few points about the uh, water studies, hydrogeology studies, et cetera. Um, while I understand that uh, you know, these people are scientists and they know what they're doing, um, let's say, for example, that we approve all this and it goes through and then the aquifer ends up getting acidified. Uh, I draw my water from that aquifer. Um, I'm, my house is a mile away. Uh, what's my recourse if it turns out that my water has been poisoned? I think the, the best answer to the question is that we, the applicant, the developer, will do everything that they possibly can to prevent that from happening. The aquifer protection area that's closest to this site is, is about two miles away. There are at least a half a dozen land uses located closer than that, that could potentially pose a risk to the aquifer. Um, quarries, construction sites, DOT, maintenance garage, gas stations. Um, so this site I think is positioned at least the same, if not better than at all of those other land uses. And we have the benefit of approaching this with all of the modern techniques that are available to understand it, manage it, and prevent it from happening in the first place. So I think that's the best answer I can provide. Well, with, with all due respect, that doesn't answer my question. What's my recourse if it does happen? Well, sure, sure. Then, then, then let me offer an, an additional angle to this. Any, any contamination to groundwater that occurs is subject to enforcement by the state of Connecticut, Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. And so if, as we know, a dry cleaner pollutes groundwater, or if a gas station has a leaking underground tank, 
Um, if there is a cause and effect, then the state will bring an enforcement action to bring about a remedial solution to the problem. That is the ultimate answer to the question. That if, if in the unlikely event that happened and it was caused by this project, then they would have to fix it. They would have to correct it. They would have to remediate it. And the state would be driving, driving that process forward. Uh, thank you for that. Um, one other thing that I noticed on your plans is it appears that you're planning to uh, heat and um, uh, do your hot water, et cetera, with propane. There's quite a lot of propane storage uh, on this site. Uh, I wonder, uh, you know, if we're building a piece of infrastructure that's going to last for decades, uh, I would rather not see it using fossil fuels. Have you considered uh, using solar power and uh, heat pumps instead of propane? The, the, sh the short answer is we are, we are looking into that. As that technology gets better and better, uh, it becomes more efficient. Uh, two years ago, for instance, um, heating, heating a warehouse of this size um, didn't work, quite honestly, with heat pumps or solar or electric heat. Um, we wouldn't rule it out at this time. We certainly, you know, if, if the technology gets there and we can get there, we would certainly do it. Um, I think, you know, should this application get approved and we get to a special permit, phase. Um, we'll know more about that. We'll know more about how that'll operate. So I guess in short, um, we'd love to do it. Um, we've done projects with propane. Um, obviously, if it's more cost effective to do solar, we would certainly welcome the opportunity to do solar. I don't know if that answers the question sufficiently. But... All right, other questions from the commission? I was wondering if you ever had uh, built a warehouse with a green roof. We've heard about your artificial wetlands and how you're going to store water on the site, but uh, it seems like uh, ecologically, a green roof would make sense. Structurally, the green roofs tend to be problematic. Um, I, to my knowledge, Hillwood has not done a green roof. Um, we would lean in the direction of doing solar uh, versus doing a green roof, but you know, again, that's something we could look more into at a special permit stage and, and assess structural, you know, impacts of the stru building structure and costs of the structure versus photovoltaic cells or things of that nature. Uh, on your plans, you have your well field uh, located in the east uh, eastern corner of the uh, site near the headwaters for the Conant Brook. I was wondering if you had uh, thought about uh, what your alternate water source might be. And I say that for a reason. University of Connecticut ran the Fenton River dry during a two year drought period. And with withdrawing the amount of water that you're proposing what happens if the headwaters of the Conant Brook go dry and the state tells you that you can't draw any more water out? What's your plan? So lo location-wise, they're schematic. Uh, one of the studies we have to do is the geophysical study to confirm the best locations for those wells. Um, in terms of running the brook dry, that would definitely be part of our geophysical assessment. And, Similarly, as part of the special permit, we'd come up with an alternative plan. Um, there's, but there were very early discussions with Connecticut Water. We haven't entirely ruled out the idea of bringing domestic water to the site, although it's a little, it's very, it's extremely early on in the process for us to really engage that, those discussions any further. Just another question. Uh, during your presentation tonight, you had mentioned 120 houses on that site as an alternate? Is that based on soil-based uh, building uh, specs or just figuring it's, uh, we can divide it up into two acre lots and let's go? It, 
the conceptual residential subdivision concept that we showed was not based on any extensive site specific analysis. Um, it was simply showing you the logistics of how the acreage could be divided up. I also note, Mr. Shabbat, that our understanding is one big difference from, <clears throat> for example, the Fenton River watershed and what happened at Yukon was that is a stratified drift aquifer. We are looking at bedrock wells at the site. So different geology with different impacts on nearby streams. And slower infiltration on your site. Exactly, and an emphasis on storage. So that's part of the water solution is to have a very slow withdrawal utilizing a storage facility, um, which would be different than the demand from dormitories, for example, which have could have a rush of use. Um, you know, when school opened up that September um, and that water demand rose quickly, we would have a hopefully much more uh, metered out approach. So the company has an absentee landlord how would you be monitoring that? I'm not gonna address that question, but just one important thing to point out, to, like the, the water demand that we're proposing, 30,000 gallons a day maximum is much, uh, on much, much, much smaller than what, like for example, what Yukon draws from Fenton River. Um, this is this equivalent of it's less than what 60 uh, single family homes would be. And you have a lot of those throughout uh, Willington. That small stream is a lot smaller than the Fenton River as well. All right, further questions or comments from the commission? Okay, I'm gonna make a, a motion that we uh, close uh, public hearing PZ 22-10. All in favor? Okay, moving on, other items on the, uh, the agenda. We have PZ-22-11, that's continued to October 4th. Uh, we have PZ-22-13, again, that one's continued to October 4th, which brings us to item E, new business, PZ-22-10, this zone change application from R80 to SDZ. Mike, do we have some uh, draft motions the commission can uh, review? So I just want to explain. Um, so these are obviously two motions, an approval and a denial. Um, and the, the baseline here in my review and uh, worked with Ken, this provides a minimum suggested findings for each so that you have essentially a consistent decision no matter what way you guys choose to go. There's blanks there, obviously, if, if the commission wants to make additions, but from the staff perspective, this is the minimum. Um, so they're, they're both there for consideration and like I said, working with Ken to make sure that they incorporate the, the, the minimum standards of what any decision should include. Um, so if you guys wanna talk over and add them in there, we can certainly do that, but um, that's the baseline. Thank you, Mike. What's that? All right, we're gonna request taking a five minute break just so we can you know, collect our thoughts for a 
minute before we, we move on with this. So five minutes. Okay, we're we're back in session here, breaks over. Okay, so we have two motions here, motion to approve and a motion to deny. I'm gonna make a motion that we uh, deny PZ 22-10, the zone change application R80 SDZ related to a zone change in concept plan application for section 12.15.4B, Zero River Road, MBL 34009-0A, 34009-0B and 34009-0C for owner Barini Circle Associates LLC, Perlatin LLC, Aslet LLC, Spring LLC and applicant Thomas Cody. Do I have a second? All in favor? What's that? Would, would you like to? Go ahead. Yep. You know, the findings that this, uh, you know, that we see this size, scale, use. Yeah, I, I, I think it deserves a bit of discussion. We have a motion to deny. I think it's uh, two things I think are, we're tasked with, uh, promoting public health, safety, and welfare without depriving landowners of all economically viable use of their property. We have a letter in file from the property owner saying he has an alternative use of the property. So we're not depriving the landowner because there is a landowner involved here. We've heard from the developer over and over. That's what we've listened to, but there is a landowner who has a right to sell his property to a, to a buyer. And, the and we're has, deliberating on a zone change. Yeah, I know, a zone but change. I know that's what we're talking about. I'm talking, I'm reading about zone changes. And so we're not, this zone change does not deprive the landowner of a viable use of this property. So that's a plus. And I mean, the, our, our denial is a plus. And we've also had many people that are in favor of it. Um, they haven't chose to speak out because they're just not very, they don't get a very warm welcome. So they've been silent on that. They're only, they're, most of the people that are in favor only mention the tax base. And I think overarching, to me, the overarching uh, piece is that I don't think this plan does promote public health safety and welfare. And uh, I do support the denial of the social. I'm going to read in some of the findings that in the motion to deny size, scale, and use included within the application materials for the proposed zone change and is depicted in the conceptual site plan. Seek to establish a development which is not consistent with the plan of conservation and development, the comprehensive plan of zoning in the town of Willington, and the considerations for approving a strategic development zone pursuant to section 1215 of zoning regulations. You know, this is a massive development, you know, with, with the potential to change the face of the town, particularly over on that edge. You know, we heard from obviously the applicant, uh, many of our neighbors in town, you know, came out to speak. I know some were in favor and probably some that were, didn't, didn't care to speak, but I think overwhelmingly we heard, you know, what, what people had to say is they, you know, we, we spent three nights of, of public comment so those, those are my thoughts and uh, any other commissioner here can let theirs be known, you know, if they, if they care to at this time. I usually speak too loud, so I thought you folks could hear me. Sorry about that. Um, Ken Slater for the record. Mr. Chairman, I was just suggesting you read off some findings. Uh, if uh, you might want to propose including that in your motion, motion based on those findings, if it's seconded and it's carried, then those findings would be adopted by the commission. So it's just a friendly suggestion. So 
So I'm going to make a motion to include those findings in the motion to deny. All in favor? Okay, now we're on to item F. That's Let's see more unfinished business. That's PZ 22-14. That's continued to October 4th as well. We're on to approval of minutes from uh, September 6th, 2022. I'll move that we approve the minutes from September 6th. I second the motion. All in favor. Next up, uh, approval of minutes from September 13th, uh, 2022. That was a special meeting. I move we approve those minutes from the September 13th meeting, special meeting. Bob seconded. All in favor? Okay, and John abstains because he wasn't, wasn't there. All right, item H, public participation. And I'll, I'll repeat, this is not for items not listed on the agenda tonight. So do we have any anybody from the public? Yeah, come on up. For the, rec for the record, my name is Linda Hosen. Can, can you turn the mic around? Can you turn the mic around so we can hear you, please? Is this better? Yes. Thank you. For the record, my name is Linda Hothen, H O T H A N. I live at 24 Pinecrest Road, and I'm here to actually speak about the minutes of September 6th. My name was misspelled, both my first name and my last name. And if you pay, play back the tape to that hearing at one hour and 13 minutes, I spelled my last name. My first name was misspelled, L-Y-N-D-A, in my entire life. I've only met one Linda who spelled her name Linda with a Y. I don't know why it was misspelled. And I don't know why my last name was misspelled when I spelled it out. This has been a very difficult time for this town, but that does not mean anybody in this town deserves to be treated with rudeness and disrespect. And I frankly don't like my tax dollars being used that way. I expect staff, whether they're employed or a, on a consultant basis, to be professional at all times. Thank you. Any further comments from the public? Yes. Hi, thank you for listening. I go on social media a lot. I live in Wellington. And to tell you the truth, I'm totally disgusted what's going on and what's written. I believe it's a witch hunt. I believe everybody has a right for their opinion. And I don't like the way the Wellington citizens are acting. They're acting very childish. You have a job to do and you must do it. We have to respect what you do. We have to respect what people say. And from what I can see, these people aren't respecting. They're, they're picking and they're, they're trying to find things wrong. And I think you guys do a hell of a job. I just want to tell you this because I know for a fact that Bob does a great job. He's on a lot of committees because I'm on some of them with them. Not committees, but the, the Wellington Historical Society. He does a great job. So therefore, I think everybody on this committee does a great job. And I think these people, these people here don't respect you. I was, I was taught to respect people. And that's, that's all I have to say, because I love Wellington. And they're not respecting you. 
social media has to go. If you have something to say, don't say it on social media. Don't, don't witch hunt everybody. That's all I have to say. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any further uh, comments from the public? Yes, Melissa, come on down. Melissa Miller, 55 Mahaliak Road. I just wanna thank you all for doing a good job. I know that you put in countless hours and we do respect you. We respect all the boards. I wanna thank you all for continuing to do online option. It's really helpful when people have busy lives. Um, even if you can't attend a meeting or you're not putting input, it is kind of nice to be able to listen to those meetings and know what's going on in our town, whether we agree or disagree, we all have to still come together. And I just wanna say, I do apologize for my outburst at the last meeting. It was unprofessional, but I thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> All right, any further comments? Anything online, Mike, that you can see? Nope. Okay. Any correspondence? Nothing under staff report or discussion for tonight. That leads us to item K. It's 9.17 p.m., meeting adjourned.